Uh, all right. So I'm here to tell you that tonight, something remarkable has happened. In a world where daily we are asked to be small, to stare at the blackness of men's hearts, I am here to do something else. I am here to honor a friend. But for me, it's more than that. For those of us that are close to, work with, are friends of Jason Blum, we are witnessing something absolutely remarkable. We are witnessing someone becoming fully actualized, someone who is becoming the best of themselves, all right? I know what I'm talking about because I met Jason at La Bonbonniere Diner. Uh, it's a greasy spoon over on West Forth, uh, West Forth and Jane, it meets. It was about the fall of 1982, uh, 82, 92, 92, I'm not that old. Uh, he walks in, he's wearing flip-flops and shorts, and I don't know who he is, but he's walking, uh, holding hands with my ex-girlfriend. It's about eight in the morning, they're in there having breakfast, you know, and I was a little upset, but he, he, he makes eye contact with me, he's got this big bushy hair, and he walks over and he goes, hey, I just saw you in that Chekhov play, you're amazing! Uh, and I'm like, uh, okay, yeah, thanks. And, and he says, hey, my name is Jason Blum, I'm a producer. And I said, uh, uh, yeah, what, uh, what have you produced? Mm. Nothing yet, but I'm going to produce a lot. And you have to understand how remarkable this is, because in the, the water that I was swimming in at that time, everybody wanted to be an actor. Everybody wanted to be a, a screenwriter, a playwright, a director. But I didn't know anyone my own age that said they wanted to be a producer. I, I, I had never met a person who said that to me. And I looked at my ex-girlfriend and I thought, I need a producer more than I need a girlfriend. And a friendship bloomed, okay? Uh, I, within the year, we started a theater company. It was called the Malapart Theater Company. And five years later, we closed up shop. And I shit you not, we closed up shop having made money. All right, in the non-for-profit theater world, we had like 45,000 bucks in the bank. All right, this is unheard of. But to understand the triumph of what has happened over the last few years with Blumhouse, you have to understand the energy that motivates Jason. It was the final year of, of the Malapart theater season. We wanted to do three plays back to back, right? So we, we rented a, th uh, a theater for three months. And Jason knew that every dark night was a lost opportunity. So Sunday nights, we had an art exhibit. Monday night, we would do readings. Friday and Saturday night, after the show would close, we would invite bands play. We put up a keg and charge 10 bucks. And when one show closed and before another one opened, this I think is Jason's finest accomplishment of his life, we had our biggest hurdle. How do you strike a set and load in another set in as little time as possible without paying anyone, right? <laughs> this is a problem for a young uh, aspiring theater company, right? So Jason had an idea. We were gonna throw the biggest party we could. He called it Strike 95, all right? And everyone we knew, so this is before the internet. I'm not, you know, we just invited everybody we knew. And we had a party. We got a keg. We got um, a couple hundred people. We turned the stereo on. We took dumpsters and put them in the front of the theater and dumpsters and put them in the back. Cranked up the music and just got everybody working all night long. So by about 5 a.m., we had the place totally cleared out. By 6 a.m., we had it cleaned. It reeked of pot. Everyone was drunk. Beck's I'm a Loser Baby was playing like nonstop over and over again. But we did it, all right? This is Jason's energy, his enthusiasm, his Tom Sawyer-like quality to get other people to believe. And I remember years ago, uh, after that, he was telling me, you know what bugs me about the movie business? In indie film, everybody wants to go to Sundance and win a prize. In the studio movies, everybody wants to win an Oscar. What if you just gave up on that? You know, what if you just gave up all that crap and you just made movies people wanted to see? That's what I'm gonna do. I was entirely against that at the time, but it's worked out for him. That's what he's done. Uh, we have a mutual friend that I called up 
uh, when I saw, I opened up Time Magazine and my friend Jason Blum is on one of the 100 most influential people in America. And I call up this friend and I say, can you believe that Jason, the guy who used to sleep on my couch, can you believe that Jason, the dude who, I had a first class ticket. He'd say, hey man, turn in for a coach and we both can go. Like that, that's who Jason is, right? This guy has made about $2 billion in the last few years. I mean, what the fuck? I was supposed to be the successful one. You know, and, and, and to this friend, I said, can you believe this? And the friend said, can I believe it? Yeah, yeah, I'm surprised it took so long. And that's what friends of Jason know. And the best part is that anyone who knows him well, uh, the, the words that you would use to describe Jason are not words that you usually hear to describe some like, you know, movie mogul. He's silly, he's loyal, he's spontaneous. He puts the highest value in the world on friendship. He's forgiving. And what makes him so unique is that he's ebullient. He is loving. He uses his success not to wield power over people, but to empower others. His big heart is always tumbling forward and that's why he's so remarkable. And for all of us that are over 25, you know uh, that if you're not shrinking, if you're not growing, you're shrinking, all right? And Jason, where are you? Jason, it has been an honor to watch you grow. You are truly the most fully actualized person I have seen to watch you be the best of who you are. You are just beginning. Actors, we phase out. Producers, you phase up, all right? And I believe in you, and the best is yet to come, and the proof is in the pudding. Here's the real.